Right. So for learning outcome four, um, you know, if you look at uh, the bits in terms of be able to apply, uh, you know, theories of theories, principles and models of learning and communication for delivering inclusive teaching and learning. Now, this part uh, predominantly is related to, you know, unit three. So some of the application of, you know, uh, theories and models that we want to look at. Uh, and then we've looked at in, in, in some of our discussions, they come across, uh, you know, in in different forms and shapes. So one related to social learning theories, the second related to, you know, um, theories which have been specifically, um, you know, studies which have been primarily done to look at uh, understanding learner and obviously classroom management behavior and, uh, you know, attitude and obviously looking at the process of inclusive teaching and learning. Now, some of these that we look at uh, that we have covered, um, you know, previously include the constructivist uh, learning theory. We also look at uh, Pajets and Wojcicki's uh, social development theory, which is where uh, that's the second one. The third one we use quite often and um, it's quite popular, the Bloom's taxonomy, which is predominantly looking at six major categories of how learners you know, essentially learn and collaboration happens in the class. So you look at knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. And then we look at uh, um, in the handout, which I provided yesterday, one of them would have been the transactional model of communication, which is in general uh, to be a good teacher and to have good teaching practice, you need to be a good communicator. And obviously that involves the process of communication. And that process of communication is important because it allows you to, you know, not only just communicate, but also get feedback, which is predominantly related from your learners in order to adjust your delivery. And then we also look at understanding one of the uh, bits that uh, has not probably come across so far is basically the universal design of learning, which is UDL theory. Now, the UDL theory talks about, you know, obviously developing inclusive teaching frameworks. And they aim to basically help students, regardless of their abilities or learning styles, to, uh, you know, uh, ensure that they get equal opportunities for them to be able to learn and succeed. And this involves uh, basically the involvement of a lot of different resources, apart from what we use predominantly in the classroom uh, when we plan teaching. And, you know, you make a schema work and you in that schema work, you normally add activities, resources that you would need whether it's videos, handouts, case. Presentation to learners. And that would also mean that they would have the ability then to express an action, things which are related to ensuring that they are engaged uh, in the classroom, and that uh, that would also inform the teacher that there are enough, um, you know, if there are not enough, let's put it this way, um, uh, you know, if they are not able to engage, then obviously the teacher gets the, uh, you know, feedback that there are, there needs to be other ways in terms of how we need to look at the process of getting them to engage, getting them, getting this uh, representative group, which is probably not participating or not engaging to look at, um, you know, their representation and also, you know, at the end of it, use the, um, let's say technology to be able to ensure that they have accessibility and in, 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 I would say in general, provide them options to be able to look at um, various other, um, let's say, tools or methods through which we can look at. So basically, there's a bit of an investigation which needs to be done. If nothing seems to be working, then how do we get them to engage, interact, participate in the class? And that could be done in different formats. Uh, sometimes when you look at adjustments, uh, and in some cases that, for example, when we look at dyslexia, people, sometimes they need a scribe, sometimes they need additional time to be able to write exams or papers. And those are the adjustments that you normally end up making. So in some cases, uh, sometimes we also look at multiple types of assessments. So if uh, the assessment, standard type of assessment is an assignment or is a paper, then in some cases they are modified to suit uh, and, you know, adjust to the requirements of the learner because of the uh, context of their disability or say, for example, in some cases, uh, a special need. So those are the bits of theories that we will be looking at, you know, four or five in particular, 
and then we will relate them to understanding how do we look at designing resources or picking up sometimes you know from the teacher toolkit what resources you pick up which essentially allow you to promote specific focus on equality and diversity and also looking at meeting the needs of specific learners. So in such cases, uh, here the focus would be to show how do we design, say, a particular lesson or, say, for example, a particular session that you will conduct. And in that, what we have to do is show the implementation of the equality and diversity policy uh, and maybe take up an example of a specific learner who has a special need. And with with that special need and the learner, how do we look at uh, you know modifying some of the resources that we use to teach and deliver which are making i would say which are which are better adapted to that uh, to the needs of that learner the second one will focus on you know demonstrating flexibility and adaptability in use of inclusive teaching and learning uh, approaches so here uh, because it says demonstrate what we are looking at is that although it is understood that teachers are always flexible and adaptable and they tailor their sessions to be able to teach and deliver to the needs of the student. But sometimes what you would also see is that you need a personalized approach and that personalized approach tends to uh, mean that sometimes with learners, you have to sit down, give them instructions and help them through uh, understanding how they would like to, you know, how they would essentially need to complete this particular task. And in some cases, you also deal with what is called multiple learning modalities, which is looking at inclusion of diverse resources, technologies to provide accessibility to the students. One such lame example of that is when you look at ATMs, you have the ATM numbers with Braille uh, printed on it, and sometimes you have hearing in loop. So those kind of additional examples um, you know, or similar examples have to be taken when we apply this in terms of, uh, you know, multiple modalities. That means learners in the class um, would also get access to all the resources which you are planning. But in certain cases, if they need more resources or different types of resources, whether it's basis technology or, um, uh, you know, it's one-on-one -on -one attention, they would need that uh, additional support to, you know, complete some of the tasks. Now, we also look at collaborative learning because when we do see learners with disability, in some cases, uh, it's not just the resources, but the teachers would need to also work with, say, teaching assistants or specialist tutors who would essentially be supervising and, you know, working with that particular learner uh, or student in this case to be able to get them through that particular, uh, you know, topic. And that would be an assistance that they would require maybe throughout the session. So bits and pieces of that, what we will need to do is demonstrate how you typically do that. So in my um, example here, in my daughter's school, obviously there is somebody who has severe autism. And in that case, uh, when he sits in the class, the learner, you know, um, th there is a specialist tutor who basically assists in uh, doing most of the activities and most of the uh, teaching and learning, which typically tends to happen, uh, you know, in the class. And being in year nine, you know, uh, he requires a lot of support. Sometimes, you know, there are mood swings and he ends up shouting in the class or, you know, creates a bit of a tantrum. And that is where this bit, uh, you know, in terms of additional support, in terms of somebody being always present next to him to help him work on, uh, say, individual. And that would mean that, you know, in some cases, somebody always with him would mean that they are providing individualized support to the uh, to the student to help reach uh, the goals that they have to meet. And in such cases, you know, this particular disorder can sometimes pose challenges in terms of, you know, uh, dealing with the person, looking at social skills and sometimes of repetitive behavior and obviously speech difficulties. So that would need to be demonstrated if you have uh, by taking an example. Then we look at demonstrating ways in terms of equality and diversity in teaching. And this bit would be essentially looking at the use of your diversity and, you know, um, equality and diversity policy in the organization. And this is to reflect that uh, if we do have students, um, you know, in the class from different cultures, different backgrounds, then you are ensuring that your learning material is non-racist, non-sexist, and is non-discriminatory. So that's the essence of it. And what we need to be able to do is basically, again, taking the policy, demonstrate it in terms of, you know, how this is done. Then we look at communicating with learners, which is learning professionals and others to try and meet the individual learning needs and to encourage progression. Here, what we are looking at is as an effective teacher, uh, we are looking at putting into 
uh, you know, let's put it this way, pinning some of the things down in terms of evidence to say, as an effective teacher, these are the learning approaches that I take. And I normally look at these learning uh, tailored approaches to learning in the class. And this would be that I communicate with learners in various different ways. And you might need to explain that how do you communicate in, in, in various different ways. And that could be done in the form of, say, for example, looking at what are the effective ways to meet the individual st student's requirement. And that would be, uh, you know, looking at communicating with uh, your learners or obviously somebody, um, you know, some of the learners or students in the class, wherein you try and do varied activities, you look at collaborative learning, and uh, to a certain extent, you also look at, uh, you know, specific tailored communication to a particular individual, which would, uh, you know, encourage them to stay with the class and obviously try and meet the goals and objectives. Um, and then the last one talks about, you know, explaining how your own delivery of inclusive teaching and learning tends to be taking into account some of the theories and principles that we will discuss at the start. And this would essentially mean that, you know, uh, you are looking at explaining how your own delivery uh, model that you have for say a particular session uh, is, is basically, uh, let me put it this way, is basically using any of the theoretical frameworks that we discuss to deliver inclusive teaching learning that has taken into account, uh, say, for example, various requirements of learners. And the whole idea here is that when you uh, take into account um, um, some of the theories, what you're looking at is um, to make your teaching more inclusive. That means you would look at methods which would provide flexibility. You would look at methods which are going to be um, using both, uh, let's say, um, not both, but maybe using all the different styles uh, that you require to be able to teach in the class, which is visual, auditory, uh, kinesthetic, and, you know, in some cases, using a combination of those. And then when you plan out some of these activities and you um, distribute or say, for example, give out these activities in the class to children, what you do is you basically look at accommodating the needs of the students with diverse learning needs, their abilities, their backgrounds, and their experiences. So sometimes what I wouldn't want to do as a teacher is to show a bias that, okay, this learner is quite intelligent, it comes from here, and I'll probably give him this activity because he would be able to carry it off or, you know, uh, <clears throat> do that activity quite well. So here the idea is to try and balance the um, needs of your students, children, learners, uh, and take into account what are their needs in terms of their diverse learning needs, how they are affected by their uh, abilities, which could be different types of abilities, and then looking at their background and experiences, and then adjusting, uh, you know, your delivery to make these sessions more inclusive. That means they're more flexible. They are instruction-led. They are sessions which are engaging, interactive, both verbally and visually, and that allows learners to participate and obviously, you know, achieve those uh, goals and objectives which have been set for that session. So that is what you need to explain theoretically in the last learning outcome. So some parts of the outcome are, you know, uh, practical. So the first one, design, demonstrate, demonstrate is practical. Communication in the last uh, four and 4.4 4 and 4.5 are pretty much, you know, <clears throat> examples that you would need to, you know, define or talk about theoretically. And they would essentially be helping you uh, showcase that what theoretical models or models of learning and communication you use to be able to teach and deliver in the class, which allow and show that your teaching practices are inclusive, they are flexible, they are accommodating, and they are tailored to meeting the needs of the requirement uh, of the learners. So if we look at the slides in the presentation that I've got, um, obviously some of them are tailored to predominantly cover these assessment criteria. The first one in particular that we want to look at is basically understanding some of these theoretical frameworks. So yesterday we looked at uh, three or four different types of theories. And when we look at these three or four different types of theories yesterday that we talked about, um, we basically focused on, um, you know, a few. And they were um, Bandura's theory. They were, um, you know, theories from, um, I would say, a Skinner in particular, um, and then, you know, from Lee and Marlene, which were predominantly related to the social aspect of learning. Now, in today's context, what we are looking at is uh, we'll still be covering the construct constructivist theory uh, simply because that uh, bit 
uh, you know applies um and it is a popular theory and obviously that bit applies to the uh, active role of learners in building their own understanding in the class so even if we do and plan the sessions in a very interactive way we put our 100% bit in into making sure that the lessons are interactive engaging uh, they they would <clears throat> let's say get all the learners together um in terms of understanding the session but at some stage what we need to have is a buy in from the learner which basically means that they need to be actively engaging in in the sessions to be able to build their own understanding and that is where this constructivist theory comes in is because it requires active participation it requires uh, you know learners to be there able to construct uh, and put what they are learning into knowledge themselves and at some stage what this would also inform us about is the competence and capability of the learners in terms of putting the information together and sometimes when we look at this bit we also include the uh, you know uh, the importance of communication and social in interaction with the uh, with the teacher in the class because this allows both the individual and the teacher to have i would say um a uh, uh, constructive dialogue which basically informs them in terms of what they are doing right what they are not doing uh, so right uh, or uh, what they are not uh, falling in terms of being incorrect and then that is where the teacher has the ability to go across and correct so that the uh, you know knowledge and skills that they acquire at the end of the session are are basically recognizing uh, you know what is being required to be completed or achieved in that particular session so this theory um you know is important because of the fact that also it helps motivate learners um you know from a point of view of following uh, these sessions and being active in the sessions uh, or being active in the class and that helps teachers to understand the learners uh, uh, much better and sometimes um it is also the fact that when individuals or in this case when i say individuals children and you know students or learners they actively engage with the teacher then rather than passively accepting the information which is given allows them to also look at uh, you know using or building their um i would say you know cognitive skills that means problem solving skills or skills which will for you know use which will let's say warrant the use of their brain or you know um, i would say how do i put this so if i say it will basically focus them on using um and let's say it will basically align them to have focus in the class pay attention obviously then process the information to a certain extent which is being provided and then remember things which will help in building their knowledge uh, in in terms of you know uh, the subject or the session which is being which is being taught so one of the theories that we can clearly apply uh, you know with, with regards to um, ensuring that we have um, children learners uh, you know engaging with us in the class at any given point in time would be to apply this constructivist theory of learning which basically says that learners just do not take in information passively but sometimes it is important for us to get them engaging interactive uh, get them to participate actively and that would allow uh, them to be able to you know gain knowledge uh, and uh, you know that knowledge gaining of knowledge would then also involve because they are actively participating that would also involve a bit of social interaction and that social interaction would lead to you know confirmation of the knowledge and the let's say the subject matter that they are studying to gain knowledge from it uh, going forward that thereby achieving the objectives which are set for the session then we look at this uh, wojotsky theory which is pyjet and wojotsky social development theory and here the focus is primarily as you understand um, of this particular theory is to uh, emphasize on and assert on the development of you know cognitive function and learning ability which obviously can be guided through by um, doing meaningful social interactions so this particular theory focuses on the fact that um, it's also known as the social um, you know cultural theory because it emphasizes the role of social interaction and the cultural context in cognitive development which means that any given stage if we look at um, you know uh, engaging with children learners or you know our students in the class uh, by building social interactions around uh, some of the activities that we do 
then learning and development can occur through this particular process. And this involves collaboration. This not just involves communi good communication, collaboration, but also cooperation because it fosters that particular bit in, uh, you know, in terms of children or students or learners having to work together to be able to, um, you know, achieve certain goals and objectives which are set. So this theory particularly has, you know, um, when obviously the studies were done, there were uh, a couple of areas which, uh, you know, were divided and obviously the studies were carried out. So uh, Wajotsky actually proposed that, uh, you know, there are some stages through which learners go in the process of learning uh, when they are learning. And that was the zone of proximal development, which is a word or a term that is quite synonymous with this theory, which is, uh, you know, ZPD. And ZPD basically was the um, you know, if you draw up a circle and then that circle is the zone in which you are working with the learners. So what you try and do as a teacher is to try and find out what is the zone for proximal development. How far are students from you in terms of that particular zone when it starts uh, and how and what you do in terms of starting that social interaction, communication, collaboration, cooperation, which will get the learning side of thing uh, going. And then there are bits and pieces in terms of, uh, you know, understanding how this interaction uh, looks at, uh, you know, getting the learners involved. And then to a certain extent, we also look at the, uh, you know, effect of teachers using, because if you are to go from point A to point B, what teachers are looking at is using the scaffolding techniques to, you know, break uh, things down, the bigger things, bigger things down into smaller bits and then slowly and gradually moving the learners closer to the zone of proximal development, which means that their and your understanding with regards to, uh, you know, at any given stage from a point of view of development would essentially be closer to what is required to meet those goals and objectives. So this particular theory, uh, you know, centers around the fact that when you give a an example that I would give here is when you give a task to a children, a child or a, uh, you know, a student in the class, they would also need some sort of assistance initially to perform that task. Now, that assistance that you provide helps in building what is called communication. Uh, it also looks at building cooperation between the teacher and the student. And it also highlights the importance of how you would teach the student step by step to reach the end goal for that task so that they are able to achieve the task. And that process is now, you know, obviously what we use and say the term scaffolding, because that is where the knowledge building tends to happen in parts. And sometimes the delivery of it in order to ensure that the knowledge is uh, knowledge building is permanent or is, is um, uh, you know, going to last that needs to be done using the scaffolding technique wherein you're slowly and gradually providing more knowledgeable, uh, you know, information or more information, which is going to build, uh, help build the knowledge of the learners. Now, there are obviously four contexts to this particular theory, and it focuses on things like, uh, uh, you know, cultural part, it focuses on social learning or interaction of it um, in, in, in the context of, you know, how this theory overall came about. And that is why it is known as the socio-cultural theory as well. Now, when we talk about um, in this theory, one of the other things which is important is when we talk about the, um, you know, higher mental abilities of the child, then in such case, some cases, when we talk about things like reasoning and problem solving, there is some relation that Wojcicki drew, drew up to say that the social interaction can also help. And the way the social interactions happen, that means the way you communicate in the class, the way you conduct the activities, the way you collaborate with the, your students or learners in the class to conduct those activities can also help in developing reasoning and problem solving abilities with, the, with your learners. And this development predominantly happens through social interaction. It can be initiated by the teacher. Some of these activities can be, you know, obviously done within the classroom. Some of them tend to happen in the external environment, but they have a long lasting effect on how, uh, you know, the child's ability to reason and solve problems also can be addressed by, you know, obviously looking at studying this particular theory. Then we look at Bloom's taxonomy. Now, Bloom's taxonomy is a very well, you know, accepted model or a framework 
which we see being implemented in all schools, primary, secondary education, even in higher, further education and higher education. And this framework primarily, you know, looks at, in very simple terms, you know, a hierarchy of how uh, students or children or, uh, you know, let's say child would develop cognitive skills. And this model or framework essentially helps the teachers and students to understand how they need to go through some of the activities, content, curriculum within the class in a in a progressive manner. So this hierarchical model is a pyramid essentially. And this pyramid, uh, you know, there are various ways through which you can put this across. So if I look at bringing a picture here just to explain it visually, what you would generally see is that at any given stage, uh, when we do talk about, you know, Bloom's taxonomy, what we are looking at predominantly is the stage through which uh, you know, learners go through in terms of their uh, development. And this development typically tends to follow, you know, six important stages. So they tend to be knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, uh, synthesis, and finally evaluation. There are different diagrams and different, uh, you know, um, uh, let's say uh, bits available. Um, when we look at how they, you know, explain this particular model, but the idea here is that what we are essentially looking at understanding with Bloom's taxonomy is that when, you know, Benjamin Bloom in the early 50s came across with this particular model and proposed this framework for categorizing how education and teaching and learning should happen in the educational context, he designed this particular framework to say that this is what the teachers should be able to follow when we are looking at uh, building, you know, curriculums. So when we talk about key stage one, key stage two, key stage three in the schools, what we are looking at is uh, basically relating it to Bloom's taxonomy to say, okay, at one key stage one, you're basically looking at building abilities which are going to be remembering and understanding. At key stage two, you'll be looking at application and analysis. And at key stage three, you'll be looking at synthesis and evaluation. And that is what, uh, you know, this framework essentially helps us understand when we look at putting it together from a point of view of application, uh, you know, in, in education. So you're looking at these six phases of knowledge. Um, the way it's been put across in this image is knowledge, which is remember, understanding is comprehension, application is apply, analysis is analyze, synthesis, and then evaluation. So evaluation tends to be you know, where judgments about certain values of uh, material methods can be given purposes by the students. They become independent to be able to produce that work and then they are able to author it, investigate it, design it, and, you know, appropriately, ta um, let's say, tailor it to meet a particular requirement uh, of the audience. And there are different phases in which, you know, uh, the framework presents different phases. So there's a detailed handout which could be looked at, uh, you know, on Bloom's taxonomy and its application, uh, you know, from a point of view of how it can be applied, uh, you know, uh, effectively to look at, uh, you know, the process of teaching and learning and how do you look at applying this to ensure that your class and the classroom is engaging, interactive, uh, you know, is inviting participation. And that is where you need to also look at whether you are setting activities which are at that level, which are meeting the requirements of the level, or you are setting activities which are much higher, where obviously the students, children, or learners in this case would essentially struggle. So it's the right level and the right appropriate level to which you would need to apply, you know, the understanding, and that would be done basis, uh, you know, Bloom's, tax Bloom's taxonomy. Now, um, what we also look at, um, you know, apart from this would be the transactional model of communication. This tends to be a particular model wherein you're looking at, uh, you know, ensuring that there is a dynamic um, environment in which the learners within the class are able to actually communicate. And when I say they are able to communicate, you know, there, there is an open dialogue which can happen between the teacher and the student. And this open dialogue, uh, you know, follows any particular communication model wherein you see normally three or five elements to that. One is the speaker, then there is some processing which happens, then the receiver receives that, and then they are able to give you feedback. Sometimes when we see in the class, if you're teaching and the students are nodding their head, that is giving you a bit of a visual feedback that what you're saying is being understood. And when feedback is understood and uh, and it follows through a process wherein you uh, again have some sort of, uh, let's say, um, 
uh, follow through in terms of what has been asked and then you answer that question. And sometimes if a number of students in the class ask, uh, raise their hand and start asking questions, then that could lead to a noise wherein you need to decide essentially noise equivalent to being that you need to decide, okay, which student to give an opportunity to, or okay, this one you've asked a question, so let me give somebody else an opportunity. And that particular uh, you know, communication method within the class, which allows uh, the interaction to happen, which allows, um, uh, you know, continuous engagement to happen. And that allows also when the questions are asked and you are able to give the answers, allows that feedback loop to be completed within the communication model itself. And this model then emphasizes the importance of, you know, active participation and mutual understanding of how things are going to work in the class. So you set some rules, you give give out some activities, and then students participate in those activities, thereby uh, confirming the achievement of your goals and objectives that you've set for the session. So a generic model, but mostly related to communication, which basically means that you need to ensure that there is interaction, there is open channels to communication between learners, students, children within the class, between the teacher, and then this allows engagement to happen uh, from a point of view of um, uh, you know discussing anything which is which is the objective of that session or of that particular uh, you know class we look at um, the universal design model and in this particular model uh, of learning what we are looking at is here the teaching is predominantly aimed at meeting the needs of every student in the class. So when we look at setting curriculum and when we look at designing the curriculum, what we also look at is do initial assessments of learners, whether they are qualified to sit at that particular level or not. Now, once we know that the learners or children or kids or students are essentially uh, at the required level and they have that understanding to be able to you know, sit and learn, then the teaching is predominantly aimed at meeting the needs of every student in the classroom. And when we look at this particular model, we also look at relating it to the inclusive teaching framework, which uh, sometimes is taken into account while designing the curriculum for a particular stage. And this aims to provide all students, uh, you know, regardless of their abilities, their experience, the learning styles, their cultural background, or, or, or you know, where they come from. It is regardless of that, it, it is aimed at providing equal opportunities to all learners to be able to succeed within the class. So when we look at some of the principles of what this model is based on, it's based on three different principles. One being that there could there should be multiple means of representation. This multiple means of representation for the learner and their learner's interest should also then be uh, translated into what is called action and expression. And at some stage, this should then allow the learners to engage on different levels within the class with the learners with the with their uh, you know peers with the teacher and that two way dialogue in terms of communication and engagement ensures that uh, you know all learners and all when i say learners children kids get the equal opportunity and attention from the teacher to be able to complete that particular task or complete that particular activity now this particular model was also um, slightly generic. And what happened over the years is that um, this has also given uh, rise to four other different types of, let's say, theories or uh, four. It branches out into, you know, other contextual uh, models as well. And sometimes when, when we talk about the four principles of UDL, Universal Design for Learning, these four principles branch out in those, into those models wherein it says you have multiple means of representation, you have multiple means of engagement, you have multiple means of uh, assessment. And that is all based on the fact that um, when this uh, model or framework is implemented, it ensures that the teaching methods which are used are used to cater to diverse needs of learners. And that is why this model is more accepted or, you know, I would say more put into practice within further and higher education because here uh, the needs of the learners would be as diverse as from where they come from, what their prior experiences and prior qualifications are. And that is why sometimes, uh, uh, you know, the curriculums tend to be open-ended in terms of uh, the activities which are set are consistent because everybody needs to complete that activity. But the way you reach the end goal, uh, there is a lot of um, 
let's say, means of how you can engage, how you can action, how you can express, and how you reach the end goal because every learner is different. And what sometimes teachers have to do is basically ensure that they are catering to or accommodating, I will put it this way, to the diverse needs of learners and how they would learn in a classroom. So sometimes you would see that when we look at, I apply this model specifically in distance learning because in our case, what we tend to see is that learners who tend to join programs with us, they are quite mature, they are adult learners, and they have the ability, they are not, um, let's say, novices in the uses of technology. And sometimes we see that these learners are able to learn from, um, you know, different formats of how material is presented in terms of teaching and learning material. So it could be in the form of, you know, video recorded lectures, it could be in the form of presentations, it could be in the form of handouts and written notes that we sometimes provide. And then sometimes we also refer externally to certain videos on YouTube or TED Talk or Khan Academy or some of the other sites, you know, when we feel that this particular inclusion of video would help because it will help, um, you know, showcase a particular concept or an example that we are discussing. And sometimes when we look at assessments, they tend to be a combination of presentations, case studies, reports, uh, you know, assignments in terms of written reports. And then in some cases, they tend to be reflective statements, flowcharts, mind maps. And the idea there is that the output through which their assessment is, um, is tallied, as long as it meets and shows the criteria, assessment criteria is being met, uh, that allows us to look at, you know, the aspect of multiple means of assessment as well. So this particular universal design model of learning we apply quite, um, you know, uh, clearly within our concept of teaching and learning, specifically in distance learning, because I can have multiple means of engagement with the learners. I can, this multiple means of engagement would also allow multiple different types of interactions to happen at different times using different mediums. It could be phone, WhatsApp, Zoom video. Uh, it could be an email. And then some stage when they are coming to, well, coming closer to the completion of the activity or a unit, then in some cases, we also allow what is called multiple means of assessment. And that would mean there are, although all of them need to meet the assessment criteria, they need to demonstrate our understanding, they need to write an assignment, but those assignments can take for different uh, forms and outputs. And sometimes it could be PowerPoint presentation with speaker notes, assignments, case studies. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, reflective statements, um, you know, case, um, let's say, case studies substantiated with flowcharts or mind maps, and that would allow still the learners to, uh, you know, achieve uh, that unit or that particular module that they are studying with us. So in general, obviously, there are lots and lots of theories that we have discussed, which uh, are, uh, you know, required and frameworks, which we can say are required and can be used by different teachers in the class. But looking at um, the context of, you know, how do we apply this uh, to look at inclusive teaching and delivery, uh, inclusive learning in teaching and delivery, I would say that these five models typically tend to be the best ones that you can look at, uh, you know, for the coverage uh, for this particular learning outcome. So to be able to apply these theories, uh, models and principles, and to ensure that there is learning which is happening within the classroom, uh, and that learning is also happening for all learners, irrespective of their background experience, um, you know, their abilities, their prior knowledge, and, uh, you know, their cultural, um, let's say, or, you know, or prior academic background would still be relevant because at the end of the day, what you would need to do is plan it in such a way that this allows uh, you know, all learners to achieve and all learners to be able to, uh, you know, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, go over the finish line. Is that okay? Any yeah. questions on this? No, I'm all right so far. Okay, so let's look at some of the assessment criteria now, you know, obviously looking at um, the first part, which is talking about designing, uh, you know, and basically looking at designing resources or using resources essentially in a way when it helps us to promote equality and diversity in the class and also meet the needs of, uh, you know, uh, learners, specific learners, if we know what their needs and requirements are. So here, what we are looking at covering predominantly is that when we look at 
um, understanding their needs and requirements. First of all, I think what we look at is the initial bits of diagnostic, their prior educational background, their experience, and also the learning style and their abilities. So some part of the diagnostic that have that have been carried out becomes important because what we need to do is identify the need of learners essentially. Now, when we look at um, ensuring that we understand the needs of learners, what we then need to look at in this task is to show how do we design resources that actively promote equality and diversity whilst in the same at the same time helping us meet the identified need of specific learners. So the idea here would be to take a specific learner with a specific need and then show how do we design or adapt our resources which would allow this equality and diversity to work with regards to the uh, meeting the requirement of that particular learner as well. So if I was an instructor or I was a teacher or a tutor, lecturer, whichever way you call it, and I want to design, say, for example, my lesson plan and activities, what I want to do is basically using the designing of my lesson plan and activities, I want to ensure that uh, I have a diverse classroom, I have different learners from different backgrounds. So what I'm going to ensure is that all my learning material typically looks at, uh, you know, the learning material that I put together does not have any sort of, let's say, um, um, any sort of racist material, any sort of sexist examples, or in some cases, making sure that the examples or activities that I'm putting together in terms of, you know, how I want to show that I'm implementing equality and diversity in the classroom would be to making sure that so the resources that I write, you know, are, are written in the form or are provided in the form which are not specific to any particular group or learner within that, uh, within my classroom. So 10 ways or, you know, a couple of ways I would put it this way that I would look at promoting this within my classroom would be to say, for example, set some rules and standards for my for my sessions. These rules and standards that I set then need to be enforced. And what I would try and do is weed out any sort of negative opinions which students might have or attitudes which might uh, be shown or manifested in some of the outcomes of the activities that I do. I would also be aware of, you know, any sort of, uh, let's say, stereotypes which are which which can be derogatory and that would be something that I would challenge in the class and not allow in my classroom so that it does not, uh, you know, infringe on any particular uh, learner and their background or, uh, you know, looks at obviously, um, um, you know, anybody which, which is being sidelined from that particular statement or discussion. Then what I could also look at is some of the uh, learning material that I, uh, you know, create is, ad is adapted and is primarily making sure it's neutral in the sense that it is in a gender neutral language, which means that some of the examples that I take could be of diverse, uh, you know, people from diverse backgrounds. So, for example, if sometimes in my sessions, if I have to talk about leadership, I sometimes talk about Nelson Mandela or Barack Obama, but I'll also talk about other types of people who would probably not be, um, you know, looked at from a point that, okay, I've got you in the class and that's why I've taken somebody uh, black as a person to give an example. But I would talk about other leaders like Mark Zuckerberg or, for example, uh, you know, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs or Tim Cook. And that would mean that, you know, uh, there is, uh, um, um, I'm not choosing, you know, somebody on the basis of their color background or, you know, uh, their education or their experience, but I'm choosing in general people who uh, my students can relate to when I give them examples and they tend to be, you know, ensuring that I have chosen people uh, from a point of view of, uh, you know, um, neutral um, in a way, I would say, you know, basically people from a point of context that everybody can relate to essentially. Now, um, the other bits that you have to include, for example, when we talk about um, how do you show that you design resources which promote equality and diversity. So here, what I would also be looking at <clears throat> in the context of designing resources would be to regularly check with my students in terms of uh, whether this format for them in, in, in terms of delivery is suitable or not. So in some cases, when I check on the format, I would check on, say, for example, 
um, in the videos, for example, is the language clearly understood? Um, when you look at, um, you know, the vocabulary or the wordings that I use in some of the presentation, is that understood? And in some cases, what I would also be looking at is including, um, you know, diverse perspectives and experiences uh, which would be coming from different contexts to highlight a particular point. The language which I'm going to use is going to be simple or straightforward. It's not going to be complex and it is going to be jargon free to a certain extent because not all learners would understand, for example, the use of emojis or, for example, short forms or, you know, uh, essentially um, in some cases, key terms. And what I would need to do is basically elaborate on that so that I'm not disadvantaging anybody by saying, OK, they might feel shy to ask a question. OK, what does this mean or the, what does the full, what is the full form of this? And then the other learners would look at them and say, OK, oh, I'm surprised you didn't know about this. So the idea would be to try and pick up. Um, and make sure your language uh, that you use in the materials which are provided, uh, you know, is neutral and is is free of jargons. Now, the other bit that I would also look at is in order to promote active participation within the class, I'm going to try and make the students feel more comfortable by asking questions, creating icebreaker sessions and discussing uh, or maybe starting a discussion on certain bits which are going to uh, you know, allow them to explore uh, and discuss their opinions. And this bit of discussing and exploring in terms of asking open-ended questions would make them more comfortable. And once they feel more comfortable, they will be more engaging in the class. And that would help me create a more inclusive classroom environment. Sometimes you have to look at tailoring resources to specific needs of the learners. And when I say that, I would mean by that is that if I have a learner who's who's in if for example for whom the english is not their first language and they struggle uh, to understand english uh, and say for example in my case it tends to be more chinese learners whose english is not the first language but they are learning english as well so sometimes some of the presentations and some of the materials that we create also tend to have what is called um, um i would say um, um you know supplementary of uh, materials which would essentially allow them to read and you know crystallize and perfect that concept which has been talked about. And those examples that I generally end up taking tend to be in their context or in the context of Chinese um, 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 region in particular. And that allows them to relate to that topic or that example, thereby helping them to understand and uh, you know gain knowledge from that topic. <coughs> One of the things that you have to also um, include in terms of, um, uh, you know, the bits in terms of feedback uh, mechanisms, because when you show that you're meeting the identified, uh, meeting specific needs uh, of the learners and that they have been identified, then there is a way that you need to be able to take that feedback uh, during the course of your teaching from learners. Now, this feedback can come in in different formats, and sometimes this feedback could come in from surveys, uh, from direct uh, you know, questions that you ask learners. And uh, if you find learners, they are, uh, say, for example, falling or lagging behind in their sessions or in the, in, in the course or in the lessons that you're planning, then in those cases, you sit down with them and take one-on-one -on -one feedback, which will allow you to adjust and tailor your delivery so that they also become a part of the group wherein they are able to understand, participate, engage, and then move forward with the lessons. Sometimes you also look at a process through which you are essentially, um, I would say, um, integrating certain strategies in your teaching wherein you try and understand the different learning styles and then the learning styles help you understand the abilities of the learners. And what you would then do is basically using the understanding that you've gained from learning styles, you would basically then look at uh, tailoring your resources um, or providing additional material and supplementary material in terms of alternative format or text to learners so that they are able to, you know, study and obviously move together with you rather than fall behind in those sessions. So all this that you can do in terms of uh, ensuring that you are trying to promote equality in diversity is, is ensuring that you are able to take all the learners across in terms of the teaching and learning within the classroom 
you are able to put additional resources or uh, tailor some of the resources to meet specific learning needs of uh, a say a particular learner and that could be by providing alternative format or supplementary material so in our case we end up sending for example to students which are which 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 at the time of application say that they have dyslexia or some sort of a disability in those cases what we do is when they join the course we end up sending them printed material uh, in order to augment their learning and most of it is made available to them in a file or in a course file at the start of the course itself and that is available with them along with the IT resources or accessibility to IT and resources from Moodle Hub but they would tend, tend to show that okay in my cohort this time i have somebody who's studying law with us and he's severely dyslexic so what we've done is we do specific sessions we upload those tutorials to youtube we have sent him um, you know printed material on all the units assignment briefs uh, and presentations and then to a certain extent what we also do for him is that when and he is not good with it so what we made is we made an exception in his case that he could submit assignments to us which are handwritten uh, or you know if he uses a scribe then he can use a scribe and obviously send in those assignments to us for the units uh, which he's not able to type but a scribe would do it with the declaration and a understanding and a certificate that he's provided us uh, which shows that he's severely dyslexic and this person and his cv has been provided which is a scribe which is created in order to ensure that we don't have a conflicting situation where the learner is using their knowledge to tell the scribe and the scribe is actually typing out the assessments on behalf of the learner to study this program. So it could be lots of different things that you talk about with specific needs of learners and how you design, tailor, modify, and you know supplement that material is what you need to show as a teacher, as an instructor, as a tutor, as a lecturer to cover this particular task. And in my case, for example, I've given an example using strategic HRM or a leadership module and what kind of uh, multiple forms of assessments or, um, you know, um, in terms of various types of, um, let's say, resources which are provided to learners to be able to understand uh, this particular unit and achieve the module successfully. So things like case studies, um, in some cases we do interactive simulations which are based on the fact that you pick up a leader of your choice and then give us details of why do you think this particular leader uh, you know, follows this particular leadership style and uh, when you identify the leadership style, you explain why you have identified this particular style with the person that you've chosen and then we look at substantiating that with a bit of, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say uh, a talk uh, or uh, uh, or a, let's say a let's say a talk or a speech which the leader is given by looking into, you know, TED uh, conferences or looking at uh, YouTube videos wherein that gives us an insight that, okay, what you identified as leadership skills and traits with this particular person is actually, uh, you know, analyzed by looking at that particular video and what the uh, person is actually speaking in that speech or in that, uh, you know, conference. And then... Sorry, Sorry can I just ask, so when we're looking at kind of this and giving examples, so would I be looking at, um, obviously, that in the context of... Um, my RSC lessons and the things and types of resources I use within those lessons. Yes, so you would probably... Well, I've used like case lessons. studies, yeah. I've used videos, I've used class discussions. So that they would be what I would sort of include here. Yes, that's correct. So you'll contextualize it to your context of how you're giving an example, because uh, this task would need you to not descriptively provide it, but say that this is how I design... Uh, and, you know, let's say tailor my resources to meet the requirements of specific learners, uh, uh, you know, for a session. And then maybe also identify the specific need of the learner and why you have been able, why it is required for you to tailor these resources uh, that you are going to provide uh, during a particular session. So I've taken an example of, say, somebody who's severely dyslexic, the inclusion of a scribe, then obviously supporting the person or the learner in this case 
wherein we've identified a specific need and then with that need we put uh, different types of resources in place or provided the resources through different routes and uh, methods so that the learner does not feel disadvantaged and they are also having the same opportunity to be able to achieve the unit and over ob obviously overall the co course finally in terms of the diploma okay Let's let's go to the second assessment criteria. It talks about you know demonstrating um, basically flexibility and adaptability in the use of you know your teaching material, which informs that the approach that you have is inclusive, and the inclusive approach then you could use different things like tech, you know use of technology, and that helps you to the, meet the needs of your individual learners. So here, what because it says to demonstrate, what we have to look at is. We need to include a couple of things. One, we need to show how do you give personalized instruction to a learner. So if you have a particular child or a student or a learner in the class which has certain, say, requirement, how do you look at giving personalized instruction to that particular learner? That could be looking at, um, you know, whereby you are providing additional resources or help uh, and in some cases, I give an example that, um, you know, in my daughter's class, there's a person with severe autism, and there is a person who always uh, is responsible for, uh, you know, providing support uh, and obviously um, supervising the learning of that particular learner in all the classes. So that is looking at how do we give, when I give out an activity in the class, I might tailor a particular activity in a way wherein uh, I might give just a brief handout to all the others. But if I know that this person has some sort of a severe disability and I need to give him the, the opportunity to participate in the same activity, then my instructions to that particular learner, student, child uh, would be a bit more detailed. And I would maybe in this case also have instructions for the person who's helping, uh, you know, uh, or supervising that particular activity uh, as far as the, uh, you know, learner is concerned in the class. So there is a personalized set of instructions which are given which will allow me to understand the need of that individual. But having understood that need, any such activity or class activity that I carry out, I normally give out tailored instruction specifically for that uh, child or that learner. The other bit that we'll have to look at in this case would be when I look at demonstrating flexibility and adaptability is to also look at you know multiple learning modalities. That means I might need to include different sets of resources uh, uh, and the, when I say different set of resources, I also mean that I would need to look at maybe in some cases, sometimes you would see that in the class, the, the student would have access to a tablet or an access to a laptop because they would need to visually be also shown what is being done. Some of the other learners would be able to come across and, you know, participate on the interactive board in the class uh, when they are given their opportunity using different, you know, props and models and pens. But in this case, if a learner is on a wheelchair, then probably accessibility could be an issue because they might not be able to uh, raise, uh, stand up and, you know, obviously participate. So in such cases, you would probably provide a tablet or some sort of a, a, a visual um, screen, which will allow the learner to either see what is happening. Uh, and in some cases, now with technology available, you have, uh, you know, tablets which work with the interactive uh, smart board and smart screens. So the learner would be able to do inputs on the smarts uh, on the tablet, which will then be reflected onto the interactive screen. And that would be looking at uh, including multiple modalities or multiple uh, inclusion of learning, you know, through various um, um, different types of resources which might not be required for the average kid but in certain cases people with uh, special needs would need that to be present so that they feel that they are also able to interact and you know participate in the class now there are several ways in which we can demonstrate this now one of the wits that we look at is as I explained to you, the inclusion of technology. So in our classrooms also for nursing, for example, what we've done is we've included an interactive smart board where up to four, uh, you know, um, learners can come into the board and obviously interact, draw diagrams or images of, you know, say digestive system or uh, any sort of, you know, human systems. And that allows them to participate and contribute individually when given those activities in the class. Now, that would also mean that at some stage when assessments are done, we could also design assessments in a way which will allow us to use the um, uh, or 
built the use of technology in those assessments and they could be uh, open book exams that we normally carry out in, in 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 some units what then happens is the learners are allowed to bring their own device byod and they bring their own device they have an open book exam they have resources available with them but in a timed condition uh, for the test they do a part of the assignment as a timed test and that would be use of technology or adapting the use of technology in terms of uh, getting one form of assessment done wherein that form of assessment uh, uses examination technique as against the assignment assessment technique and that would be one of the things that we could do which demonstrates flexibility and adaptability in trying to promote inclusive teaching in the class you would need to think of you know ways in which where and how you would be able to do this so sometimes you look at various communication tools it could be zoom that we are using right now uh, it could be Skype, it could be SharePoint, it could be other forms or platforms which learners can essentially use and they choose the method of communication and that allows them to sometimes, uh, you know, contribute to the assessments which are being done. So one of the things that we do in one of the activities in strategic human resource management is that learners are required to pick up a job advert and they are required to essentially appear for an interview for that job advert. Now, when they appear for that interview for the job advert, it is done through Zoom. And what they would then do is present themselves as a candidate and use Zoom as a communication tool to basically give an interview um, uh, to me or to one of the tutors. And that would be looking at helping them build uh, you know, practical skills of how they would use technology. And this is something which was seen during COVID quite a lot, which allowed, uh, you know, um, collaborative learning to happen because some part of the activities which were done predominantly in the class could not be done because of uh, the pandemic and they had to be transferred online. And in such cases, the use of technology and various communication tools allowed us to still run uh, these activities and get the assessments done in the format, although be it in electronic, but uh, because of the use of technology. So here, what I would suggest is, depending on how you want to bring across, um, you know, um, uh, showing that how your teaching can be inclusive and what are the various approaches you're, that you are using to include resources and take help of technology, which would help in meeting the need of the individual learner would need to be done to cover this particular assessment criteria. And an example here, would be uh, good because at the end of the day, it basically is going to ask you to demonstrate how this flexibility and adaptability is brought in. And one such clear route that you can look at taking in my case that I do is use of technology and use of technology allows me to show that this is what I've done. This is how it has been done. And that's how it allows, you know, the um, um, uh, flexibility and adaptability to be built in. Uh, as far as uh, when I say, when I do, uh, you know, inclusive teaching. So when I do inclusive teaching, it also means that I'm rec recognizing some of the barriers, uh, you know, which students have. And during the pandemic, it was not possible for them to come across to the premises. And in such cases, what I did was adapted um, the, um, the activity to include the use of technology and that provided flexibility to the learners wherein they could sit in the comforts of their home and obviously give this interview uh, which was recorded and that allowed me to meet the needs of the assessment uh, of, of the awarding body but also allowed uh, flexibility uh, for the students to be able to complete that activity. Is that okay? Yes. Now and the next one talks about demonstrating ways in terms of how you would promote uh, you know say um, equality and diversity in your own teaching. So when we talk about the inclusion or, you know, the uh, inclusion of, or say, for example, the reflection to how do I include the equality and diversity policy uh, within, uh, you know, my teaching uh, at UK University, what I would do is I have used my own, you know, center's policy on equality and diversity. And I have I will basically use in that policy essentially so how I implement the principles which are uh, required for promoting 
uh, you know, quality and diversity in the class. That means I'm going to look at uh, making sure that my learning materials are non-racist, non-sexist, they're non-discriminatory. And also what I would do is adapt some of my learning materials, uh, which I provide to students, which would hopefully support the students who need the extra help. And that could be in the form of supplementary material like handouts, case studies, journals, articles, in some cases, in also looking at different forms of material, which will incorporate different learning styles. So for example, in some cases, I end up sending them links to two, three videos. In some cases, I end up sharing, uh, you know, a voice podcast or a recording with them. In some cases, I give them printed material, and that allows me to include, you know, and incorporate, um, uh, let's say, um, different requirements uh, from a point of view of different learning styles. So when we look at relating it to why it is required, you want to show that obviously the curriculum that you are delivering to is ensuring that it is able to meet and, you know, uh, contribute to the learning of different learners who have different abilities and obviously have different experiences and different academic backgrounds. So in such cases, inclusion of different types of resources, not just presentations, but case studies, theoretical frameworks, examples, and also, uh, you know, videos allows us to show that there is, um, um, there are ways through which I can uh, deliver that same topic, but uh, because of the diverse uh, usage of uh, teaching materials, I can incorporate various cultural and social perspectives, which will allow learners to relate it to their, uh, you know, relate this to their task or the learning outcome that I'm teaching in the particular, uh, you know, session. I'm also ensuring that I'm making the teaching and learning material easily accessible. So in this case, um, sometimes when you, uh, and the case in point would be when you call up the bank and you say you want to order a print statement, uh, you know, sometimes what they say is you can order the statement in large braille uh, form, uh, printed format as well. Or in some cases, what they also do in the, um, you know, the automated voiceovers that you hear that if you need any specialist assistance, then that can also be provided. And that is one example of how uh, banks or financial services providers are basically incorporating the needs of uh, learners to make it make their services accessible. But within the classroom, what I would want to do is basically then provide that material in different formats, as I've explained. And sometimes um, that material in different formats makes it easier for learners to you know, uh, go through that material and thereby it allows them to also progress in the process of teaching and learning as it's happening with other learners in the class. Diverse methods of assessment, which is something which I've specified slightly earlier to say that you know sometimes multiple assessment types might also be included, like an open book exam, like for example, the inclusion of uh, you know uh, quizzes or case studies or uh, for example, uh, presentations with speaker notes, and that would allow learners, uh, you know, in this case to, um, I would say, feel and, uh, you know, uh, this is where you're actually demonstrating the promotion of equality and diversity in your own teaching, because not all learners might have uh, the same requirements. Some of them might want to, uh, you know, write assessments in different ways and thereby providing flexibility would allow this to uh, be showcased. So depending on what are the main key areas in your equality and diversity policy, you could look at talking about creating an inclusive learning environment. You could talk about challenging stereotypes. You could charge, uh, talk about engaging student participation. You could talk about flexibility that you give to students to be able to achieve and obviously submit the work. Sometimes when we have a extenuating circumstances from learners, they need additional help, support, or, or additional time to be able to submit assignments or you know complete assessments. So in those cases, you're looking at obviously um, you know, giving them additional time and this shows equality and diversity in terms of you know your own teaching and learning. So any such point that you feel would allow you to uh, would allow you to you know cover this would be um, would be the bits of how you would cover this particular you know assessment criteria. Is that okay? Yes. So I'm just picking out basically the key points of my equality and diversity policy and applying it to how it works within my school. 
Yeah, because it talks about demonstrating. So you might need to pick up one or two facets of that within the policy that you have. And that would be good enough to primarily, you know, cover this particular assessment criteria. Okay. The next one talks about, you know, communicating uh, with learners, learning professionals, and, you know, how it shows that you're meeting individual learning needs and how do you encourage progression. So here we are looking at basically the aspect of, um, I would say, um, uh, to a certain extent, you know, uh, talking in terms of how I look at my communication within the class and how do I tailor my communication, which basically helps me, um, uh, you know, engage with all my learners or all my students in the class. So there would be various strategies that you could employ. Um, that would basically show that you are able to communicate with different uh, in different ways with learners, learning professionals or individuals which are in your class. And that could be in the form of strategies, uh, which include, say, for example, talking about, say, I would say, um, just as an example, um, um, you know, sometimes what we do is if I if I have to give you an example, how do I do this in the classes? I would norm say, for example, certain learning outcomes in certain units require, um, you know, practical applications, or I would use practical examples to highlight that this is how this task needs to be uh, completed. So in such cases, what I would normally do is I will carry out activities which are predominantly going to be dependent on uh, uh, and, you know, asking learners to do activities in group role plays, or in some cases, break them into two or three different rooms and say, okay, go ahead and, uh, you know, go away and discuss this uh, and come back with what your uh, thinking or thought process is in terms of how this problem would be resolved. Now, this bit in terms of collaborative uh, learning, which I try and promote by giving them activities, breaking them down into groups, into different rooms and say, okay, can you go ahead and discuss and come out with, uh, you know, uh, say points which we will discuss uh, to uh, see what uh, you have been able to come up with in terms of a solution. So this would be um, through group activities, through discussions which I promote, and in thus in such cases that would require learners to communicate with each other. That would require learners to understand uh, each other in terms of their thought process and where they are coming from, and there would be in some cases heated discussions about amongst learners and, you know, different uh, people in the same group, which will bring across different perspectives to say, this is how this needs to be done. No, no, I would say, let's do it this way. And those discussions would effectively, you know, meet individual learning needs and thereby, you know, encourage collaboration and participation in the, in the class. Now, that would mean that you would need to have some sort of tailored communication in terms of the activity that you explain. You would obviously tell them that you would need to do this as an activity. These are the do's and don'ts. And then what I do as a teacher is eavesdrop into individual rooms to look at uh, sitting in the background and actively listening to what they're discussing and how they are discussing the topic. And then give them different perspectives if they're digressing or if they're going away from what is required to be done, then give them ideas. And, you know, these ideas would essentially then not just help me communicate with learners, but also help me check uh, regularly to see whether the discussion that they're doing is primarily on the lines what I want to do the activity or are they digressing from there. Obviously, some bits of these group activities would encourage, you know, collaboration. This would also look at engaging uh, learners in particular. And sometimes what will happen is once these groups come together and then present their findings, because we will give them opportunity individually to present their findings. They would also look at, you know, engaging with other groups or, uh, you know, members in other groups. And that could be sometimes, uh, uh, you know, take the form of external stakeholders. So sometimes what I do is um, if I give them an activity or a homework and say, okay, can you go ahead and, you know, discuss this? And we'll we'll have a you know summary discussion on this next week. Some of them would go back and ask some of the other colleagues and peers to say that oh, okay, can I get some help from you because you had gone through this activity last year, probably with the same tutor or the lecturer. And uh, what was your line of uh, thought or your discussion? And can I get some ideas or you know can I get a reference to what you had actually presented? So in some cases they might even go across to, you know, people outside the groups to be able to, uh, you know, get, I would say, data or information 
thereby uh, you know looking at communicating with other professionals and that other professionals when i mentioned would be the lmni or you know past students which have done the program because they are on the moodle hub they are able to see uh, you know who are the past learners they have email addresses of that and obviously that allows them to communicate with them use of technology and use of technology in some cases uh, also would be helping them to uh, you know let's say um uh, complete a particular activity this would encourage obviously some sort of completion of that activity would also sometimes uh, you know uh, uh, let's say um, completion of that activity encourages progression because on moodle we can see a visual sign that this particular document has been accessed and this particular document has been downloaded and that allows us to say that okay this means that the learner has come up to this content and you know has completed reading of this content whether it's happening online or offline and that is the use of technology that we use to try and see whether the learners are making progress on the Did you go through it and did it make sense? So what you're doing at some stage is also taking feedback and, uh, you know, um, um, you, the use of technology is allowing you to take that feedback, track it, and that allows, uh, you know, um, to build a better communication strategy with your learners to see that they are moving forward, they're progressing and they are completing the task. So by looking at some of these strategies in terms of, you know, how you would encourage students to sorry Roman I can't hear you so basically in some cases what you'll have to do is you have to look at you know um, predominantly talking about different strategies and these strategies essentially could be one or two and these strategies then could be something that you discuss with examples of how you would use communication or, uh, you know, give activities which would ask them to collaborate offline or the use of technology. And that would show how you're communicating with learners and, you know, other professionals. So other professionals could be teachers, other forms of tutors who are teaching the same batch or the same cohort and you're exchanging notes and then you're looking at the individual learning plans and seeing that there is uh, progression being done or there is progress being made on some of these activities by the learners and that would show uh, you know help you cover this particular task 4.4 is that okay yeah the last assessment criteria talks about you know um, you doing a bit of a reflection on how you're looking at uh, making sure that your own delivery of teaching and learning is taking into account some of the theoretical principles that and models and frameworks that we've talked about. So here I would suggest that you explain by picking up one or two uh, theoretical models, which we have discussed in the initial starts of the slides, and then maybe apply that particular model to say, this is how I take into account this particular theory and then use it in my own delivery. So in my case, what I've done is, I've just done a table um, which basically, you know, shows that these particular theories, this is what I do and how I apply apply them in teaching and what is the impact it has on my, the learning of my uh, learners. And that is something that you could do. Now, I don't expect you to do it for all the theories, but pick out one or two, which would essentially allow you to explain it in detail. Even one with a bit of an explanation in detail in terms of how it helps you in building an inclusive teaching classroom or in, do inclusive teaching in a classroom would be good enough. But here you would need to definitely uh, explain the theory, say how you need, how you've related it to your, um, you know, teaching. And then towards the end, give an example to show how uh, this is actually helping you to essentially, um, uh, helping you essentially to, you know, create a classroom wherein you have learners who are learning and who are progressing and who are, you know, obviously meeting the goals and objectives which are set. That was the theory and explanation and then an example of application. That, that is correct, yes. So one theory which you explain briefly, then you give out an example, of, so then you relate it to how you teach in the class and why is it something that you can relate to and then give an example to complete the, uh, you know, 
the task by showing an application that this is how it is helpful. So that brings us to the end of uh, this particular learning outcome, which is uh, looking at be able to apply theories, principles, and models of learning and communication to deliver inclusive teaching and learning. Any questions on today's session? Um, no, I think I'm actually okay. I think I'm all right. So we, we're meeting again tomorrow, aren't we, at 10? So. That, that's correct. So my suggestion would be to go through these theories in a bit more detail, the four or five that I've looked at, uh, and then see which is the most appropriate one that you think, or maybe a combination of one or two that you think you are using uh, you know, in your teaching and learning um, or on a day-to-day -day basis when you do teaching and learning in the class with your learners. And then basically tailor everything across for task 4.5 and essentially, you know, uh, task 4.4 as well to a certain extent. So which shoes am I using? So 4.4.